Welcome to Worship at Flower City Church. I'm glad you're all here and that you found the place. What do you think of the space? They did a pretty good job, right? Yeah. So I came in super early thinking, because I'd been in this room as they've had it set up in their normal setup, and thinking, oh, I got a lot to set up. And I walk in and it looks like this. Nice. So I wow. got to chill this morning until 1025 when I realized that I thought Christina had the Boltons and she thought I had the Boltons. So we ran home. And in case anybody's wondering, I was wrong. It's just like, shouldn't be a surprise that, that it was me. And it's not, it was me. It is the third Sunday of Advent. If you have been with us and you know what Advent is, we've been, I've been encouraging everybody throughout the entire Advent season to contemplate the mystery of the incarnation. What does this mean, that God became fully human? And, and what we do during Advent is we wait, and we focus on this as a season of waiting, a season where we are different than what's going on in our culture, which is already celebrating Christmas, that we are waiting, waiting for the incarnation, but not only waiting to celebrate the first coming of Jesus, but we remind ourselves in this time of waiting for his first coming at Christmas, we remind ourselves that our whole lives are a period of waiting for his second coming, when all things are put right. And so purple is the color. We remind ourselves it with purple of penitence and preparation and, and penance and, and, uh, and longing. It's also the color of royalty in the Roman Empire, but mostly we think of it in the church as a, as a color of longing. We light candles, one more candle each week. This being the third Sunday, the pink candle is finally lit. The reason that the pink candle is lit on the third Sunday is that there are five candles in all, including the Christ candle in the middle, which we light on Christmas, that is halfway there. And so in the midst of our penitence and our preparation and our waiting, light starts to break through. So we remind ourselves that even in a period of fasting, even in a period of darkness, that there is no darkness that is dark enough to completely eliminate the light of Christ. And so the third Sunday, we remind ourselves of that with a pink candle, which is halfway between purple and white. We have um, our music in the bulletins that we ran and got and are starting late because of. Our, our music uh, today, we, we have uh, the songs of praise, and all of our songs are actually in the back of the bulletin. And we will alert you, Renee, or I will alert you to what page we will sing on, and we'll get to our songs of praise in just a moment. Let's first start with our opening sentence, which is printed in your bulletin. In all cases in the bulletin, whatever is in bold is something we all say together. Whatever is in regular font, the worship leader will lead. The Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming. Rejoice greatly. Shout in triumph. Our king is coming, the righteous savior, who shall speak peace to the nations. We will start with our two songs of praise. The first is found on page 14. The second is on page 11. The first, Lift Up Your Heads, Ye Mighty Gates, on page 14. Let's stand and worship God. Um, yeah. there, was, there was a change. To, I'm sorry. It's, it's, four, it's tw- um, 14 and 16. It's 14 and 16. Let's start on 14. <laughs> yep. Thank you, man.
page 16.
God does not want us to wallow in our shame or guilt. God restores us, calling us out of our guilt so that we can participate in his work of redemption and renewal. When we confess our shortcomings, God pronounces pardon, saying, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Your sins are pardoned. The penalty is paid. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. As a people forgiven by God, live in accordance with his promise. Wait for new heavens and a new earth where righteousness is at home. And while you are waiting for these things, strive to be found by him at peace, without spot or blemish, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. Please stand for this morning's altar. Seven through ten. Be patient, therefore, beloved, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious crop from the earth, being patient with it until it receives the early and the late rains. You must also be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Beloved, do not grumble against one another, so that you may not be judged. See. The judge is standing at the doors. An example of suffering and patience, beloved, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Our second lesson continues um, our time in Isaiah for this season. We're going to pick up in Isaiah 35 and start at verse 1. 
And uh, we're going to go, to, uh, actually, we're going to do all of 35. <coughs> Isaiah 35, let us listen for the word of God. The wilderness and dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, be strong and do not fear. Here is your God. He will come with vengeance. With terrible recompense, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap, leap like a deer, and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. The water shall break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. The haunt of jackals shall become a swamp. The grass shall become reeds and rushes. A highway shall be there, and it shall be called the Holy Way. The unclean shall not travel on it, but it shall be for God's people. No traveler, not even fools, shall go astray. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Let us pray. Lord God, we pray that you come into this space, come and move among us as a corporate people, collectively come also into our hearts and move among us as individuals, Lord, that we may be open to your message for us today, both individually and as a church, called to serve this city and to make your renewing love visible here. We pray, Lord, that you move our discussion, that your spirit move us so that we might be shaped evermore into the image of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, for whom we wait and in whose name we pray. Amen. So, we have had for a few weeks now, and if you've been with us for all three weeks, there's kind of been a common theme that's been running through these passages, this theme of kind of of an ultimate hope, of, of no more death, no more pain. And what I want to do, I want to just, just start with, with how we view these prophecies. We got into this a little bit last week, and maybe we've talked about it, or at least touched on it all three weeks, but I just want to spend a little bit of time to get this in our heads of how we think about these prophecies. And, and the question I want to ask you are, are there's two questions. Um, have they been fulfilled, is the first one. Have these prophecies come to be? Nobody knows. In part. Okay. Unpack that. Um, so we keep seeing that um, there are some things that have come to happen, uh, like metaphorical things of Jesus has come and brought with him the kingdom of God. Um, he has brought spiritual healing and spiritual reconciliation. But these other things that we see, like there's still people who can't see, there's still people who are broken. Um, the world is still broken, there's still injustice, there's still inequality, there's still systemic mm -hmm. problems in our in the world. So, no, I don't see uh, a global peace. Okay. Anybody have anything to add to, challenge, affirm, just kind of build on what Chad said? Any other comments on how it has come to be and how it has not come to be? I think one of the um, things we can miss sometimes is like, Same bringing more. God's kingdom now, so I think some of that's speaking to, like, um, he's given us gifts and abilities and everything in this life to bring his kingdom come, so to provide healing in many of those ways, and Jesus himself for miracles in those ways and other things, so that happens now, but it, it will not be perfect or as it should be until Christ is here. Okay, did everyone hear, Ashley? Because I can repeat it if you didn't. No, okay. 
So one thing I want, I, want to, I want to push on one thing you said for now, and I want to come back to the rest of it, because it's all very important. One thing she said was, um, we can easily um, hear these stories of this fulfillment of all things being put right, and kind of, kind of have a tendency, I'm paraphrasing, and Ashley, just wave at me if I say something that isn't in the spirit of what you said. We can kind of have a tendency maybe to sit back on our heels or sit on our hands and feel like, oh, we're, well, we're just waiting. We're just waiting for Jesus to come and put all things right, and we can miss the part where we have kind of an active role in what's going on and, and how, it's, how, how we're building on, on that. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Okay, but we're going to come back to that part. The second thing she said, though, that I want to kind of maybe push on a little bit now because that's to do with the timing of has this been fulfilled, is it being fulfilled, or when will it be fulfilled, is but she noted when, when Jesus came, all these things did happen. Right? Like Chad said, well, people still can't see, and people still, there are still people who can't walk and can't see. But when Jesus came, what are some of the miracles Jesus performed? Go ahead, just shout them out. There's something like... The lame could walk. The blind could see, the lame could walk. People were hungry. People who were hungry were fed. Other things? Water into wine. The wine, yeah. Let's not, let's not forget that the kingdom of heaven is not dull. Forty. <laughs> Other things? Um, the mute could speak. Yeah, how about just go down the list here, right? Strengthen the cams to make firm people knees, right? You even see it with the spirit, the disciples who were scared and feeble suddenly were strong and not afraid they spoke with the, the the strength of the spirit the eyes of the blind were open the ears of the deaf were unstopped the lame shall leap like deer the tongues of the speech shall sleep for joy water shall break forth in the wilderness when did water break forth in the wilderness in the exodus right how about yeah is that what you're gonna say buddy very close but it wasn't abraham right 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 moses right so Exodus, Moses in the wilderness, right? So we see all these things happening, and we see this, this restoration happening in the person of Christ, and then when he's no longer physically present, now we come kind of return to this period of time. People call it kind of the time in between the times, or the already not yet, right? In some ways, this has already been fulfilled in the person of Jesus, and in some ways, it's not yet perfect fulfillment for eternity. It's something that we got a glimpse. It's like, it's like the table, where we get a glimpse of the feast. We got a glimpse of eternity, during the time of Jesus' earthly ministry. That's what it will look like, what he came into contact with and all the healing he brought about, but it'll be on a universal and eternal basis. Does that make sense? People want to, want to push on that at all? Okay, before we get to that Ashley's second point, because I want to spend some time on that this morning, I want to ask how the first hearers of Isaiah's prophecies understood them. Did they understand them the way we just said? No. Jay, okay. this is for you. No. How do they understand him? Jay, I guess this is for you. Well, they were, they were looking for a return to an earthly kingdom. Okay. And what would that entail? What would that entail? That would entail a, a, a king. Okay. A wise king. And he would bring good things for everybody? Okay, so it was an earthly kingdom, and it would bring, he would bring good things, but he would bring good things in a very narrow way for a very specific set of people, right? There's the, the universality is gone, right, with this, with, with the envision. Okay, so how do we understand them? We said some of what we just understand. How, how do but say maybe a little bit more about how we understand these and inver- how it's different from what they said? Well, we kind of said the universal nature and kind of the future tense of Jesus' ultimate return, right? So here's a question I have. What, when you envision Jesus' return, right? If the original hearers who are steeped in their Old Testament and their history far more than we are misunderstood the prophecy, how might our understanding of what's coming be off just as theirs was? Just take a minute on that and, and then when you're ready to speak, say anything you, you, you have about how, how our understanding could be off since theirs was off or why we feel more confident in ours, or you know, why, why, why do we think we've got it right? Go ahead. Um, I think because we're so far removed in time and in culture from the original prophecies that maybe we have a tendency to, um, to make everything a metaphor or an allegory and mm-hmm. um, to overlook um, to overlook some of the immediacy of it, um, to 
Yeah, and, and I think it connects to what Ashley was saying earlier about how we have we have a concrete part in it, and it's it might be easier for us to to sort of like make it yeah make it over over spiritualized. I don't like that word, but okay. Yeah, is that yeah. so? Renee's suggesting one way we could be off is that sometimes in the church you hear this talk as if the healing that comes is only a spiritual healing, and boy, I mean, I love. As you all know, I love the ancients and their theology, but the ancients really spiritualized this stuff. Oh, the parched land and the desert are the, the desert of our souls and the water gushing forth and it is the, the good news of the gospel making us new and, and, and we're all spiritually blind until we hear the good news of Jesus and our eyes are open. And, and I think there's Which something that's true. I, yeah, I think there's something that's right about it. that. Yeah. Right, exactly. But I think we, we forget that when Jesus came, he actually said, No, when I say I bring good news to the poor I mean, I bring good news to the poor. <laughs> not, not the poor in spirit, not that you can sit there rich and comfortable and say, oh, well, if I just confess right, then I'm going to be part of this. It's like, no, I'm coming to bring something to a very specific set of people who are on the margins of society and outside. And if you're part of my ministry, this is what you will do. This is how you will participate in it. Any pushback on that or anybody want to build on that? I was just going to say, um, I think it's also like this, we seem to think that like miracles Like there's still things that happen, like healing still takes place. I think sometimes it's easy to read the Bible and think like, well, if it doesn't happen in an instant, or someone touches you and you're healed, then it can't, it's not a miracle. It's, yeah, that we look for the dramatic. Yeah. And we we, we kind of miss the everyday miracles. Okay. Or we just account it to science or religious people, or mm -hmm. we've done these things to heal versus God in a personal Okay. Others? One of my favorite authors is called The uh, Chronological Snobbery, that since we are in the 21st century, we therefore know more than people in, um, like before Christ, or in antiquity, or even 17th century, 18th century, somehow we're on this upward trajectory of knowledge and self-actualization um, that makes us the fulfillment of, of intellectualism. And because of that, and therefore we're supposed to we can actually interpret the Bible um, when that's just not true at all. Mm -hmm. that, um, there are different ways of thinking, different, different types of literature in the Bible, and um, all sorts of things that makes that make sense to them, and it's not necessarily read in our, in our culture. Do you agree with Chad and Ashley? Any, anything else on that in terms of... Right. Uh, we, we've seen it in action, I guess. So um, we, have, um, we have an example. Mm -hmm. So two things. Jay, Jay, just so everyone can make sure everyone heard. Jay, Jay I think everyone hears. But Jay is saying that, that everybody, I think, I think everybody post-Christ, so you're saying the, the whole 2,000 years post-Christ, has more information than the people before Christ had about what these prophecies might look like and mean in their fulfillment. So that's one piece that we have that maybe more Isaiah's, at least Isaiah's original hearers didn't have. Within that 2,000 years, you're acknowledging there's still some debate about how to interpret these things, but at least, at least there's something that we're having a conversation about a Christ event that Isaiah's hearers would never have, have thought of to, to incorporate into the, the conversation. A suffering Messiah was not what they had in mind. Um, Chad, I want to make sure everyone heard Chad because I know he's up front and speaking this way. And then talking about chronological snobbery. I like that phrase. Chronological snobbery that every, every kind of time looks back on previous times and thinks, well, we know more than they do. And so everything they knew was different. And I want to push on it to see if people would agree that, that maybe this could this, um, be the difference between knowledge and wisdom. That we do, we do, in fact, have more knowledge than previous times, previous eras. If you go 100 years ago, we knew more than they did. 
we know more than they did. If they go 100 years before, they knew more than the people 100 years earlier did. And so in terms of like scientific knowledge and discovery and awareness of, of, of how the world works, um, that we probably have the how question. We have more answers to that. But the why question, the kind of philosophical question that has more to do with wisdom than knowledge, I don't, I don't know that we know anymore. Is that like chronological snobbery looks at that we have so many yeah. answers, more answers about how that we think we now know the answer about why. Yeah, there's but that not that's necessarily where it's... a correlation between <clears throat> scientific understanding of the universe um, and, or material understanding of the universe versus like spiritual. Mm -hmm. uh, there's not necessarily a connection. Yeah. Anybody want to say any more about that or everybody agree with that, that idea? Okay, let me get to the, the second thing Ashley said then in the very first comment she made, which is a question for you all then. What should we do while we wait? If we're acknowledging we have some kind of role, what is our role? What, what, what are we supposed to be doing while we're waiting for the world to ultimately be put right? What does that mean? Okay, others? Okay, so give me a concrete example of what that looks like today. How do we go out and do that? Okay. What about as we go down? What does it look like for us to open the eyes of the blind? Well, there are some of those everyday miracles. Studying, being in college and studying how to do these things is not your place in your time. Yeah, exactly, right? I and mean, when we talk about, actually mentioned so just, just eye surgery, like doing that, going and being a doctor and being an eye surgeon who opens, who, who gives sight to people who didn't have sight. If, I mean, if you're doing that in Christ for the sake of this other person, right? You're not just doing it to, to make a living, right? As, as we consider how we make money and how we spend money. Like these are things that we can look down and say, well, is what I'm doing productive toward the kingdom or is what I'm doing just something that hawks some wares and, and pays the bills, right? And we can, we can start to look down this list and say, well, am I, am I bringing to people in need in, my, in what I do with my, with my life? Am I, am I making an offering to, to God out of what I'm doing? Even, you know, you said in our charitable works, just bringing a meal to kids who might, not, who might be in need and helping an organization that's helping kids, and then we just kind of come alongside of them and we do it. Diapers for kids who are in need. I mean, meals at the Center for Youth. These are things that we just come along there every day, miracles, that, that somehow people that are on the mar margins are being provided for. And I guess that's what I'm looking for, just like concrete things that you see that can be done. What do we do? What else? We welcome people into our homes who are probably people outside of our like social circles or or maybe on the margins or um, 
we break down barriers of inequality and um, like um, social constructs, you know? Yeah. Did everyone hear that? Yes. Okay. Others? I'm going to say two phrases, and I'll leave these for you guys to think about. The first is, um, I'll just like start with a little pet peeve. Like when people talk about, um, we go out and build the kingdom. Uh, I don't think we do that. So I'm just going to throw this out that God builds His own kingdom. Thank you very much. That, that we don't build anything. Like I, watch the prepositions. I don't think we do things for God. I think God does things through us. And so I think I think we have a role. And so so the the, the phrasing that we've used, and, and even our our um, our mission statement is to make God's renewing love visible. That's, what we, that's something we can do. So, so making the kingdom visible, which I, I know it's a little bit semantics, but I'm just going to distinguish that from building because building sounds like I'm doing something. And making God's renewing love visible sounds like God's doing something and I, I'm kind of, kind of putting some flesh on it, which is the second phrase I want to give you. As we move through Advent, I want to encourage you because we Protestants do a terrible job at this. I want to encourage you to think about the person of Mary. I want you to think about this question. How is the church like Mary? And the answer I give to that question is that the church is like Mary in that we give flesh to God. Mary gave flesh and substance to the second person of the Trinity, the Word. The Word was spoken through her. She gave birth to the Word of God. And He had flesh. And He dwelled among us. And that we as the church... Are people say, oh, it's kind of you know, cliche, the church of the hands and feet of God. Well, it may be a cliche, but there's some truth to it. We give flesh. We make these promises visible in our lives. And so if we look at our lives and we say, are we making these promises visible? Are we giving flesh and substance to the person of Jesus Christ in our own lives? Please take a few moments for quasi-silent meditation. Forget this. Joy, 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 joy. This, this, the passage ends with the statement of, of God's joy. And Frederick Beekner, Frederick Beekner says this. Then I'll leave you for quiet meditation. Joy is home. God created us in joy and created us for joy. And in the long run, not all the darkness there is in the world and in ourselves can separate us finally from that joy. Because whatever else it means to say that God created us in his image, I think it means that even when we cannot believe in him, even when we feel most spiritually bankrupt and deserted by him, his mark is deep within us. We have God's joy in our blood.
We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Advent is a time of waiting, a time of preparation. Our culture rushes to Christmas, but in the church, we pause to reflect on what it means to receive a gift. In our pausing, we remember why there is need first for the first Christmas gift ever given, the gift of Jesus Christ given by God to the world. Hopefully this reflection helps lessen our own excess in the Christmas season and stirs in us a deeper desire to participate with his mission, a mission of hope, a promise for those who suffer, a gift of life for those who live in a world obsessed with death. As we wait for all things to be put right, let us pray to our God that he may strengthen us with the desire and strength to live in ways that anticipate his final victory. God of new beginnings, we give thanks for the gift of life. We give thanks for a season when the land is at rest, a time when the long, cold nights encourage us to pause from our labors and reflect on the work of the past year. We give thanks for the anticipation that comes with planning the new year and the hope that comes from expecting new life when the seasons turn again towards fruitfulness. God, we, th we give thanks that when, we, when our world has gone dark, when humanity has chosen death instead of life, you came and brought a promise of renewal. We give thanks for the first coming of your son on the first Christmas. God of the coming age, we give thanks for the promise of your son, the promise that all things will be made whole, made right, restored, redeemed and renewed. We wait with eager longing for that day. God of the present, as we live in this time between Jesus coming as one who is vulnerable, helpless, as one who came to suffer with us and with those in need at, and the time when Jesus will return in final victory, we lift up the needs of our world today. We pray for those for whom these promises seem like nothing more than a fairy tale. We lift up those who struggle to find a warm place in these dark nights. Those who have had no work, no accomplishments, no milestones to reflect on from the prior year. We pray also for those who live in such excess that they have forgotten their humanity. For those who seek to fill their emptiness with things or power or status or sex or money. We pray for strength, courage, humility and grace so that we who call ourselves disciple of Jesus can speak his promise of good news in ways that provide hope to everyone regardless of their circumstances. We pray that we might be made ready to celebrate and share the blessing of Christmas. We pray all of this in the name of the one who is coming and who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. As we prepare to come to the table, we remember that we come together as part of a community of faith. As a sign of that corporate existence, let us greet one another in the priest of Christ. The peace of the Lord be with you. You're going to do it, you're seven? Yes. Yes. Thanks, Ashley. Thanks, Ashley. Thank you. Thank you.
So folks, before we get to the meaning of the sacrament and our communion prayers, this is a very unfamiliar sanctus that's brand new to us. And the past couple of weeks, we seem to be struggling with it just a little bit. So I've asked Renee if she's just going to run through it real quick before we start our communion prayers. Go ahead. Sure. Oh, I'm sorry. Before she does, oh. it's, it's on page six. Oh, we're running. Okay. And the sanctus on page okay. six, the sanctus is a part that says, holy, holy, holy Lord God of hosts. It starts with those words. It's on page six, about halfway down. That's what the Sancti sounds like, and you guys hopefully have some familiarity, or at least it's kind of fresh in your head. The Lord's Supper, which we're about to celebrate, is a feast of remembrance, of communion, and of hope. And we've been talking a lot about time today. And, and the table is a place where time converges, where when we talk about eternity, I think sometimes we just think of eternity as, as still linear, having no beginning and no end and going on forever in both directions. But that's not really what eternity means. It means outside of the line of time where time collapses and there is no time, almost like a fourth dimension, if you will, or some other way that helps you think of being outside of it. The table exists outside of time, and for a brief moment when we come forward and we partake of these, of these elements, this bread and this wine or juice, we, we eat them in faith, we are somehow participating in the eternal feast that all of God's kingdom celebrates all of the church throughout time and space comes and is with us in some way on this table. So I invite you to think about that as you come forward, to come forward and receive the grace and mercy that God offers for you. This is the Lord's table, and all who desire grace and mercy are welcome to come to the table. If you desire to participate in Christ's mission, if you desire to receive his grace and his mercy, you are welcome here. You do not need to be a member of this congregation or of this denomination. We will say our communion prayers. The conclusion of them, Ashley and I will stand. We're not going to be able to do much of a circle today, so we're just going to be over here, and we're going to count on you guys to be able to figure out how to come up one way and go back another without tripping and running into each other too much. So we'll be there. Um, if for whatever reason you are not participating in the Lord's Supper this morning, you will find some words printed out on page 7. And there are prayers, different prayers for different reasons somebody may not be coming forward. And I just invite you to read through those words and just see if any of those prayers speak to you, if any of those prayers address a place where you are, and if, if they speak to you in a way that you want to kind of unpack them and talk to them, talk, talk with me about them later, please do so. Just get in touch and we'll, we'll talk about those words or, or what you found meaningful. Otherwise, I invite you just to kind of sit in silence. I think there's still some donuts left. You can grab a donut um, while everyone participates in the Lord's Supper. Um, I think that's it. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. With joy we praise you, gracious God, for you have created heaven and earth, made us in your image, and kept covenant with us, even when we fell into sin. We give you thanks for Jesus Christ our Lord, whose coming opened to us the way of salvation and whose triumphant return we eagerly await. Therefore, we join our voices with all the saints and angels and the whole creation to proclaim the glory of your name.
Most righteous Father, we remember in this supper the perfect sacrifice offered once on the cross by our Lord Jesus Christ for the sin of the whole world. In the joy of his resurrection and in expectation of his coming again, we offer ourselves to you as holy and living sacrifices. Together we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these elements, O God, and let, the, let us be strengthened through them to bring good news to the poor, lift the blind eyes to sight, to loose the chains that bind, and to claim your blessing for all people. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory, and we shall feast with all your saints in the joy of your eternal realm. We wait with eager longing for the fulfillment of your promise. Even so, come Lord Jesus. On the night on which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to them, and he said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and he said, Drink this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant, which is sealed in my blood, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. Come, for everything is now ready.
few announcements before we sing our sending song. Um, the first is uh, regard, in regards to community groups. This is the second Sunday of the month, and so normally community groups would meet this week. But we have our Christmas party this week, and so what I'm planning to do, and I'll make sure this is communicated clearly by email as well, but what I'm planning to do is treat this like our third Sunday and next week like our second Sunday, meaning community groups and leaders should plan to meet a week from Wednesday and a week for Thursday for conversation. This week will be the fellowship week, and we'll all do it together on Thursday night. I'm hoping and hoping you're all going to be at the Christmas party. not coming to the Christmas party? Uh, everybody look at Ying and go like this. No, I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We love you, Ying. Um, if anybody needs more invites, I have them. I may not have them with me today, but I can get them to you this week uh, in terms of paper invites. Share it on Facebook with invite friends through Facebook. Whatever else you need to help get word out, um, Santa's going to be there. we got prizes. It's going to be fun. And that is Thursday night, 7 o'clock at the Blossom Road Pub. So I hope to see everybody, or almost everybody. I'm just kidding. Ian. I'm just kidding. Everybody else there. Um, the other thing is Christmas Eve. I know some people are traveling, but we are having a Christmas Eve service with our friends at South Wedge Mission at their place. Um, I'm hoping just to get some people, I'm going to talk to some of you today, but we'll, we'll have some people where we have worship leadership roles in that. It is a joint service. I just planned it this week. Um, one of the things we're going to do is instead of preaching, Matt, who's the pastor at Southwood Mission, and I, and neither one of us like titles, so it's just Matt and Dave, are going to sit and we're going to engage with questions that you all or anybody else has about the Incarnation. So if you have questions about Christmas, about what all of this means, Submit them to us by email, and we're just going to pick a few uh, soon in the, in the next week, because he and I are going to get together after next Sunday. We can submit it on Facebook. We can have time, time at the Christmas party. We're just going to pick questions and talk about what this means and questions that people have about how to understand that. So I encourage you to submit those questions. Um, the last thing is tonight, since we're lighting our pink candle today and the joy is breaking through our penitence and preparation, we are singing carols and drinking beer at Buddha Pub. It is at six, 6 o'clock, the doors open, we can start gathering, the carols start at 7. I've been told that if you want a seat, you should probably get there between 6 and 6.30. Carols start at 7, we're going to have fun, and that again is with our friends at South Wedge Mission. Actually, that's their thing, we're just kind of invited to go and join them. So I hope to see some of you, I'll be there singing carols and drinking beer, and hopefully uh, we'll see you. Does anybody else have any other announcements? Yeah. My birthday is on Tuesday. Your birthday Yay, is on Tuesday. Happy birthday! Nice. Yeah, perfect. All right. Our last, are, any others? Um, the only thing I was going to share is Colleen and I talked this morning, so once their new baby comes, we're going to all send out an email that has a link to sign up for meals. So okay. if anyone's interested in bringing them meals, but hopefully everyone will be. Um, that's the way we can love them. When the baby comes, we'll let you know. Yeah. So just to make sure everybody heard that, Ashley is coordinating because it's a great thing to bring meals to new parents or... Second time new parent, new, when, when a new baby comes. And so that they don't get 10 meals on one day and then zero for the next five, Ashley's going to coordinate so we can sign up which date so people know and, and can do that. Um, so we wait with eager longing. Yes, thank you. Any others? Um, yeah, the last one would be then also we're doing, bringing cookies to Barrel next Sunday at 5.15. So we're going to be at the writer's house to assemble cookie plates and then deliver them right after that. So if you want to bake cookies but can't deliver, then that's great. You can just bring them on Sunday morning. And we'll need um, deliverers too, so whoever wants to be a part of that. Okay, great. Everybody heard that? Okay. We'll any others? We'll close with um, soon and very soon on page 18 after you receive your blessing for the week. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And may your spirit, soul, and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Page 18. Let's try that again. Oh